Hi, uh, I'm Dan. I'm a principal engineer in Next Silicon, and I'm going to talk about two of our uh, new products. Uh, one of them is the Arbel Risk Five Core. Uh, that's a new Risk Five high performance core. That, to the best of our knowledge, this is probably the fastest Risk Five core currently available in the world, uh, taped out at TSMC five nanometers. Uh, this is a dual core system uh, with extremely high performance. Uh, 10 wide uh, decode, eight issue instruction, uh, eight issue uh, execution engine. Uh, very, very competitive performance for for the RISC-V ecosystem for Why the first time. Why did you decide to design a RISC-V SOC? Right, so actually that ties into uh, chip number two. So one of the, what we actually started in X Silicon is with this with this thing, which is the parallel accelerator. So the reason this one exists is because we have a different take on how parallel applications should be expressed uh, in the world. Uh, those parallel applications should run on this accelerator. However, so over there on the wall, I see. Uh, it says, be a maverick. What are you, what are you showing here? Right, and so what does it have to do with this? I'll drop this one just for a second. So this is actually what we call a dual die solution. So uh, in here, in the middle, you can see a single die of the maverick accelerator coupled with four HBMs on the side. And this is, in total, a dual die solution. Uh, our branding really likes to play with, uh, with fun uh, naming games, right? So a die to die for. Uh, this is a dual die. So this is one die, this is the second die. And they're connected like in full speed? They're connected, uh, I'm not sure we're talking about it yet, so uh, okay. I, I, I won't say. Uh, and this, is a this is a die image of the same single die. So basically in, in this one you have two of these stacked uh, vertically on top of each other. Uh, what you're seeing here is our data flow accelerator, right? So we take a different approach to how parallel applications work, should work. Uh, and in our approach, we effectively track your application, automatically convert it into data flow graph format, uh, express that through a process we call projection. So we project your data flow graphs on our device, and then those data flow projections uh, take some, so a single data flow projection will take some portion of this device for a single instance of it, and we can have multiple duplications that uh, expose additional parallelism, right? So we have two formats of uh, parallelism here. One of them is data flow uh, parallelism, which is essentially building a huge pipeline out of your graphs and injecting multiple threads to run one behind the other uh, in hopefully full throughput and get like amazing performance from a single duplication of your graph which then you can also duplicate and get multiple ones of. So uh, when, I, when I look here, it says uh, 20 times over CPU, four times over GPU. Right. So the architecture you're doing, you claim, claim it that it's the most powerful for AI uh, computing? Right, so what we're, what we're claiming is that you're going to take your code, uh, C, C++, Fortran code that our compilers support. You will have to recompile that with our compiler. Uh, that compiler is essentially uh, a very thin wrapper around LLVM, so there's very little risk of the code not working, or you're not getting into into a, a known uh, an unknown uh, vendor of compilers. And once you compile your code with our compiler, we have the liberty then to take portions of your code and place them on our devices and get you seamless. Uh, acceleration on our device. That's the general way that we talk about acceleration. So we're talking about seamless acceleration uh, that doesn't require software engineers to rewrite their code from day one, right? You can basically take existing code, clone it, compile it with a change of the compiler, and start running an accelerator on minute zero. And, and uh, by I... the way, we also have, uh, we're starting to have more like uh, YouTube videos where you can actually look at this whole thing working, right? So you can actually look at us running uh, code on the accelerator from, from the get-go. Is this the generation one? Right, so this is the gen one devices. These were- It's in the market? Uh, it's in the market. It's uh, deployed in several uh, national laboratories and they've been using it, evaluating it, and that's, that was really the key driver for us in understanding 
more realistic workloads of what's required. You can also see that it was also with four HBMs. There was no dual die solution back then. Um, and this was a similar yet uh, less nuanced architecture than this one, right? We've taken learnings from the Gen 1, apply them to Gen 2, much in the same way we're doing this for future generations, uh, for the Maverick Gen 3, uh, which will come on. I don't know if other companies do it too, but I, I, I saw that Apple did the dual die the, on the Max chip and they have uh, some kind of right, high so bandwidth between the dies, and yeah. it's one way to double the performance, kind of, right? Right, a, a dual die, and even beyond that, is becoming a more standard way. So as companies basically uh, start scaling, uh, start making larger and larger chips, and they hit the reticle size of, uh, of modern manufacturing, which is around 836 square millimeters, uh, you end up, um, you end up in a situation where if you want to scale your performance, if you want to provide more uh, direct on-package solutions, you need to start putting two chips with some sort of a die-to-die -die, uh, solution. Uh, it's similar in spirit to chiplets in a way, but it's chiplets with extremely high bandwidth between them. Uh, this is something that Apple does. Uh, NVIDIA B200 do this as well, uh, and future versions of NVIDIA chips. AMD have been doing this, obviously, uh, and we're no different than them at some point. So you just have to this. have very fast memory bandwidth between the two dies. It's That's not just... only memory bandwidth, it's also just bandwidth, right? Because in the end, if you end up, especially in a data flow architecture, uh, you might end up having uh, code span multiple dies. So you actually, you, your data as it flows through the computational graphs, it actually flows also between the graphs, right? So obviously the main driver of usage for this die to die is memory, but it's not only for memory. It's also for control, communication, for just for life, for execution. So how does it compare this design with the yeah. one you have behind with the RISC-V? Uh, so what is the right. difference so, in right. terms so of the architecture? This is a very uh, standard yet high performance out of order or core, right? So this would have, this would take a single thread and would speculate the hell out of it. Are you talking about this order. one? This one, the top yeah. one. Right, so the top one is a standard out of core, out of order core with very deep, uh, you know, hundreds of instructions into the future when it's trying to speculate which instruction should run, what should it execute, which memory to prefetch, etc. So this is, this is running a very low amount of threads but in extreme uh, performance and extreme ins instructions per cycle, basically. Uh, this, on the other hand, uh, has no pretense in doing out of order execution in any way. Here, this is basically this is a latency machine and this is a throughput machine. That's the difference. And the marriage of both of them into a future single platform that would do both of them is basically how you get uh, the best out of out of the limitations of existing software, right? Because in the end, parallel accelerators, I'm not going to shock anybody, they're all limited by this uh, rule that's called Amdahl's Law. Amdahl's Law basically stipulates that the serial code is going to be the limiting factor for your maximum degree of parallelization. Now, this is like the layman's way of talking about uh, Amdahl's law on the one hand, the other way of thinking about it is that the more you can reduce the impact and the footprint of the serial code in your application, the more, the higher your parallelization factor is, right? So just like two numbers to throw, if, uh, if your serial code is taking up 5% of your runtime, then your maximum parallelization is going to be 20x. But if somehow you bring your own chip and you're, you manage to uh, chip away at the serial code and reduce its impact from 5% to 4%, suddenly your maximum parallelization level goes from 20 to 25x. So really the marriage of having full control, vertical, horizontal, whatever you want to call it, from, from the get-go for the entire application to run on an optimized experience, this is really what... So they have completely breaks. different roles in the system. Right. Effectively, different parts of the application would end up running on different parts of the chip. So this, a single parallel application will find itself bifurcated, or not even bifurcated, it's more like chopped up, right? And like a portion here, then a portion there, then back a portion here, back a portion there. You need to communicate all the time between them. And we hear the supercomputing show here in St. Louis. There's a lot of experts in parallel pros uh, programming for parallel computing, right? Uh, how many experts are there in the world who know how to make software that really works great on a system like this? 
So uh, I think that people in uh, scientific national laboratories, in existing users of HPC systems, let's put it this way, there's uh, governmental, uh, defense, uh, biological, uh, all the bio, bio sci life sciences, sorry, um, and finally commercial HPC that goes from, again, uh, life sciences also is a form of commercial HPC, uh, oil and gas, also simulations, weather simulations, all these people have been combating with accelerators and parallel computing for the good part of the last two decades, uh, if not more. And they're definitely, they understand what we're offering and they understand what we're trying to give them. Um, so that's kind of like the crowd. Lately, I think that the AI crowd is basically, although it's, it's funny to make that claim, but AI is effectively a subset of the HPC domain, right? So if you look at the entirety of HPC, AI is a subset of that, although admittedly, it's a subset that's probably in dollar bigger. terms, it's bigger than HPC, but still, you know, terminology wise, it is a subset. So AI people are obviously also uh, part of the same uh, concept, right? So people writing inference engines and training uh, loops, whatever, uh, all of them, they, they all work under the same rules and limitations and challenges. And here at the booth, you're, you're showing some uh, uh, OEM partners uh, yeah. like our, who are using your chips uh, in actual hardware that's shipping or that's sure. going right. to so ship. So we have uh, partners shipping standard 19-inch racks uh, HPE, Dell with our PCAE cards, right? So that's, uh, the PCA cards are predominantly single die devices, so basically half of what we just saw here. There's a different uh, package for the same thing. Uh, and they're, they're uh, rated at around 350 watts per card. Um, this is quite uh, unsurprisingly twice that, right? So this is uh, 700 uh, and change watts. Uh, and we also have a OEM-based uh, system here. And this is uh, with our partners at Penguin Computing. And in this system, you can see a single CPU. So this is probably a bit more uh, similar to some of the accelerators that you're seeing across uh, SC with a single uh, host CPU connected to four OEM cards, which each of them is a dual die device, right? So in total, you have eight dies here um, connected to one host CPU. Nice. Uh, so, so uh, your oh, and by the way, you can also track these uh, blue wires here that go from these cards to the front panel, and you can see that we also have basically network ports that feed directly into those OAM cards. So your technology is um, is is going to grow. The market is looking at this, and this could be a big part of the future of uh, AI and supercomputing? We certainly hope so. That's that's our vision, that's why we're here. We want to we want to make parallel computing more accessible uh, in the sense that you don't have to rewrite software to start experiencing it. Uh, that's, that's a major improvement in the quality of life of people who need more performance. Um, and yeah, that's our vision. Don't get fooled by fake HDMI products. Only source authentic HDMI products from licensed HDMI adopters and authorized manufacturers and resellers to ensure compliance. Counterfeit or unlicensed products can cause poor performance. Certified HDMI products undergo official testing for safety and spec compliance. Avoid brand damage, warranty issues, and customer dissatisfaction from unlicensed products. Long-term cost savings come from reliable, genuine HDMI solutions. Unlicensed products may lack support and pose safety risks. Use certified HDMI cables with official HDMI certification labels. Report suspected counterfeit products at hdmi.org slash resource slash infringe. Thanks to our global partners for helping keep the HDMI brand real and ensuring consumers get the experience they deserve.